Hello class, welcome to the next segment in lecture 24, and in this segment we're going to talk a little bit about antibiotic and catabiotic flow patterns, which are flow patterns that are frequently found in very mountainous and hilly areas. And this is sort of an extension of the atmosphere boundary layer because typically, excuse me, typically these flow patterns occur in the atmosphere boundary layer itself. Um, maybe an exception to this rule might be Mount Everest, which extends really high into the atmosphere, but most of the time, uh, most hills and mountain ranges, uh, these flow patterns will be occurring in the atmosphere boundary layer. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is the idea of an anabatic flow pattern, and sometimes you'll also hear this referred to as a valley flow pattern. And more generally, these two flow patterns are referred to as a mountain valley circulation. But you'll talk more about the details of that probably in your mesoscale class, which will be your spring senior year. So the whole idea behind this is you've got a mountainside that's exposed to direct sunlight. And it turns out that since the air atop the mountains is much uh, drier, it's much easier to heat up. And if you've got uh, some sort of slope surface, then you can actually absorb more heat on a slope surface than may, maybe a surface that's completely flat. And in the case of an antibiotic flow pattern, the slope of the mountain heats up much faster than what's at the what's at a lower elevations. Sometimes this is, occurs in the base of the valley, and this actually results in a flow that rises. And the primary mechanism behind this is again buoyancy, buoyancy that's driven by a surface that's absorbing heat much more rapidly than another surface. And this is kind of similar in some respects to a sea breeze circulation, but it's a it's pretty much the same general idea, but a slightly different mechanism. Um, we'll actually take a look at a diagram that sort of illustrates this, but since you have all this rising motions occurring as a consequence of this differential heating, uh, this tends to result in an area of low pressure that forms in the base of a valley or at lower elevations. And again, we'll take a look at a diagram that sort of illustrate this, illustrates this a little bit later on. But I wanted to sort of introduce these ideas before we take a look at that. And the opposite of this would be a catabatic flow pattern, which is also sometimes referred to as a mountain flow pattern. And it's sort of the same mechanism, uh, except that now the slope of the mountain cools off much faster than the air at the base of the mountain or at lower elevations. And as a consequence, you have negatively buoyant air, which then wants to descend down uh, to lower elevations, which then results in what we refer to as downslope flow. So it's also, much like a sea breeze circulation, this also has its own diurnal, diurnal cycle. And again, it's driven by uh, different specific heat capacities. In the case of a sea breeze, though, it was a difference between the water and the land that was causing the differential heating. In the case of animatic and catabatic flow, the differential heating is due to the fact that you've got a slope surface and also the fact that the air is not, uh, you have different densities in the air. If the air is less dense, then it's much easier to change the temperature of that air, which will then imply that you have a lower specific heat capacity. But the underlying mechanism is still largely the same. Differential heating caused by uh, different uh, values of specific heat capacity, which then cause a temperature contrast, which then sets some atmospheric flows in motion. And one uh, important consequence of catabatic flow patterns is this tends to result in colder air collecting in the base of a valley. And this has very profound uh, consequences for agricultural reasons. Uh, one of the biggest hazards for agriculture is a say what's often referred to as just an off as a freeze event which is uh, the temperature gets below freezing and if you've got vegetation that is sensitive to sub-freezing temperatures then if the temperature drops below freezing then the agriculture or the crops could then freeze to death uh, and so if you've got uh, some sort of crop that is say resting in the base of a valley or resting at uh, resting near a mountain if you tend if you end up with a catabatic flow pattern you're going to get a uh, cooler air that's collecting in the base of that mountain or at the low, lower elevations and if that cooler air happens to be below freezing then you might end up with some damage to some of your crops so this idea of antibiotic and catabatic flow patterns can play a very important role in ag agriculture and it's uh, really important that farmers are aware of this. They have it's really important that they have accurate predictions of what the temperatures might be in these valleys or in these areas of lower elevation. Because if that temperature again is below freezing or even below, uh, say, 37 degrees Fahrenheit, where you can get frost, that can also be hazardous for crops. But if the temperature is sufficiently cold, then that can result in crop damage. And the farmers need to know about that so that they can protect their crops from these really cold temperatures if that becomes necessary. But something else that's kind of interesting. Uh, this is on a much smaller scale, but you can also sort of see the effects of these flow patterns on an 
on say uh, really large stadiums, which are basically built like artificial, basically built like an artificial mountain valley system. You won't necessarily experience the flow patterns. You won't experience the upslope or the downslope flow. But on occasion, if the conditions are right, you can experience the temperature contrast that does occur with anabatic and catabatic flow patterns. If you've got a stadium that's built just right and subjected to the similar differential heating mechanism that we talked about, if you go down near the base of the stadium towards the, where the, uh, at a lower elevation, you can actually get air that's slightly cooler than air that might be at the top of the stadium. And uh, this is a kind of an interesting effect that sometimes comes into play. And sometimes uh, this, the, the construction of the stadium also plays an important role in this. So if you've got AstroTurf, that is really efficient at absorbing heat and also really efficient at releasing it. Uh, but it, again, it's the uh, whole idea behind this differential heating. Again, I want to emphasize this happens at a much smaller scale. Sometimes you don't even notice this. The conditions have to be just right for this occur to occur. But it is something that can also happen to stadiums because they're sort of like miniature hill uh, hill valley systems. But uh, again, since they're so much smaller than the typical hills and valleys that you might see uh, at other and in, in an area where there's really rough terrain, uh, this typically happens on a smaller scale. But the same effect comes into play. It's just at a much smaller scale, and sometimes you might not even notice it. But uh, on a really uh, on a really good case of this, sometimes you can notice this effect uh, in the uh, in the content in the realm of a, a large sports stadium that is basically built like a massive valley. It's basically a large artificial valley which can carry this effect. But as promised, let's go ahead and take a look at some diagrams to sort of illustrate this exact process. So if you can imagine, we have say a mountainous region. It doesn't have to be mountains. It can also just be hills. But here you've got a nice mountainous area, and again, the slope of these mountains is going to heat a lot faster than the air at ground level at the lower elevations. And as a consequence, you will get this uh, region of relatively hot air, which is going to want it to rise, since uh, it's, it's going to be positively buoyant. And if you get a sufficiently uh, strong rising motions, that can lead to a region of lower pressure forming in the base of the valley, or at the lower elevations. And as contrast to this, it would be a catabatic flow pattern, which typically occurs at night when everything is allowed to is allowed to cool off. And if you have uh, if you have cooling off, the uh, air in the the air in the slopes here is much cooler. Then you're going to have negatively buoyant air, and that uh, air is going to want to descend downward. And this can also result in a region of relatively high pressure. And at some point, the air in the valley becomes so cold that the air the descending air can't actually go into it. It can actually can actually make it into the valley, so it's actually kind of deflected on top of the shield of cold air that occurs here. So you can actually end up with a region of relatively warm air that rests right on top of the cold air. But typically this results in a region of cold air which pools in the base of the valley and also a region of relatively high pressure that forms where that cold air is. And again, these flow patterns are really important for uh, people who manage crops, because again, if that cold air is sufficiently cold, then your crops might be in danger of dying from the really cold temperatures. But that's going to do it for this segment on anabatic and catabatic flow patterns. And in the final segment, we're going to talk a little bit about urban flow patterns. So with that, I will see you all in the final segment.